Good evening. This week's parsha is Chukas Bolok, and on in Tammuz we know that the yard site of the Orachaim Hakadosh takes place on Tesva, which is next week, and the Orachaim Hakadosh, as we know, had. The level, there's five levels of neshama. There's nefesh, there's ruach, there's neshama, there's chaye and yechida. And the Baal Shem Tev said that if he travels to Eretz Yisrael and meets the Orachaim HaKadosh, that there's a chiver of himself, which is nefesh, and the Orachaim HaKadosh, which is ruach, And just by speaking to each other, Mashiach will end up coming. So the Baal Shem Tov tried four times to get to Israel. On the fourth time, he and his whole family were almost killed by cannibals. So he said, I got the message, they don't want me to make it to Eretz Yisrael. And it was in those two and a half years that the Arachayim HaKadosh lived in Eretz Yisrael uh, that he tried four separate times, as I said, to get there. I also want to mention to you that on his second visit to Eretz Yisrael, on his way, and every time was a different problem and he had to turn back and go back to Mezhebush, he made a stop in Prague after the second try to Eretz Yisrael. And he went into the forest and he toiled over the three, four months that he was there. He toiled 310 times in a pool of water that was open and people who have gone there have said that it's colder than the Arizal's mikvah, which is freezing, and that many people were helped. And the Munkacher Rebbe, the Minchas Alazar, who passed away around 90 years ago, uh, he used to have in his sukkah, behind his chair on the wall, as part of his Noi Sukkah, the decorations for Sukkahs, a picture of a stone that was in that mikveh in Prague where the Baal went, and somebody inscribed Khan Beirach HaBaal Shem Tev as the Mayan Zoo, this pool of water, the Baal Shem Tev gave a very strong bracha because after his 310th Tvila there over the three, four months that he kept going back every day for more Tvilas, um, he gave an unbelievable bracha. And there was an Israeli who moved to Prague and lives there today. And his whole parnasa is people get off the plane, they don't know where to go, how to go. And he takes them, and it's both men and women, they put up sheets around because it's mamish in the middle of the forest open no building no nothing and it's ice cold and this israeli who has his parnasa by driving people from the airport to this mikvah waiting for them and showing them what to do and how to do and everything has his parnasa from this said to someone who went there last year that eight of the ten women who came to be toivel, all of them needed children, wanted children, and he is aware of eight of the ten in the last 14 months that were answered and had children. After 10, 20 years never having children, from toiveling in that mikvah. Now, th- nothing to do with that. This Friday is Arab Shabbos Parshas Chukas. Now, this Shabbos relating Chukas and Bullock. It's a double sedra. 
Some years it is, some years it's not. And the Mogan Avram brings in Shulchan Aruch that on Vo, it's the only fast that's not with a date. In other words, it's the Friday of Erev Shabbos Parshas Chukas. So whether it's the second day of Thomas or the tenth day of Thomas, makes no difference. It's not tied to the date. It's only Friday, Erev Shabbos, Parshas Chukas. And it is a fast day, not an obligation, not a chiv. And um, what happened? That there were 20 wagons full of sforim that were burnt on that day in France. And it happened around uh, seven or 800 years ago. And the Mogan Avram, who lived 450 years ago, writes that there is a minig, and it's because of the terrible tragedy of the burning that they burnt all these sforim. Now you have to remember, we go into a sforim store and there's no problem. If we want five uh, sets of pumashim or 10 sedurim, we just buy it and we have it. But in those days, before the printing press, to have a safer was the Yakara Metzias because they had to do it by hand. They had to, there were, it was a major undertaking to have 20 wagons full of every Hebrew book, every safer that they could get their hands on. It was a very super tragedy. Now, Tzaddikim said, how could this have happened to a community in France? And they answered and said, because like a hundred years before this tragedy, they publicly burnt the Moira Nevuchim. The Moira Nevuchim was, is a sefer that the Rambam wrote. And there are chakiris, there are questions which he answers, which ostensibly look like he's questioning in Emuna certain things. And of course it was Kodesh Kedoshim, it was the Rambam who wrote it, but there were communities that felt that maybe it was on the border of questioning HaKodesh Baruch Hu. The questions, and so they burnt it publicly. So Tzaddikim said that the reason a hundred years later, because they never did shuva on what they did to the Rambam Sefer, and it came back to haunt them. So uh, I'm saying this year to you Wednesday night, I usually do it Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, but there were reasons I couldn't do it before. And this Friday, which is just two days away, if you went into Shomer Shabbos, you will find that they, there's a whole big minion fasting and laning vayachal, just like on a fast day. But I want to underscore that this is not a chi of something anyone must do. It's brought down in the Mogan Avram, and it would be proper, he says, behavior for someone to fast to commemorate the tragedy that happened to Klal Yisrael. But by no means is this equal to a Shiva Asr Batamiz or a Tisha B'av or anything like that. But I just wanted to mention for some who may not have heard of this Vav Shvat, the Friday, a day before they read Chukas to commemorate that very sad Friday in that city in France. Now, in Parchas Chukas, I'm going to speak a little bit about Chukas and then a little bit about Bolok. And we know that the Parsha opens with Pora Aduma. And as everyone knows that there's many things called Chukim, and there are no reasons like Basr Bechol of milk and meat together, or Shatnes, or Kalayim. Uh, or where we shecht on the neck of an animal, those are all chukim that we don't have reasons for. But the problem, problem, in other words, the, the difficulty 
where Torah Duma is that it is diametrically opposed in the same commodity. That somebody, when the coin took the ashes of the Pura Duma, we had nine Pura Dumas, and the tenth will be when Mashiach comes. That someone took the ashes, and if he was Tomei Mace, they sprinkled it on him, and he became Tohar, he became pure. But the Koyen who sprinkled it became Tomei. So how one thing could have such a different effect, a commodity, that's why Shlomo Melok said that, and he was the wisest of all, that he didn't understand it, that this was one thing that he could not give any time to because it was like diametrically opposed from within. It made the same thing, made Tahar or made Tome. So that would, um, that posed a question. I hope it's not going to make too much noise. You'll tell me if it does. Um, that there was this problem. Now, it was like a double-edged sword. And the Medrash says on the opening of our Parsha that para aduma elu Yisrael, that this is comparable to Klal Yisrael. And Reb Moshe Feinstein in his Sefer has a very big discussion as why does the Medrash compare Klal Yisrael to Porah Duma. And the first thing he says is because just like Porah Duma has no rhyme and reason, when Klal Yisrael accepted the Torah, they said, Nasa Venishma. Hashem went to every nation and offered it first to them, and they first wanted to know, what are we getting ourselves into? And when they heard that they can't do this and can't do that, they said, oh, no, that's not for us. But Klal Klal Yisrael, excuse me, said, Nasa Venishma, that we will do whatever you're asking us to do, whatever the Torah says, and Nishma will hear about it, the details, the everything to it later. So said the Rosh Hashiva that Klal Yisrael, who went in blindfolded and accepted everything, that's like a gedder, that's like a category comparable to Paraduma because we're doing something that really there's no rhyme or root. we don't understand how one thing could be Matar and Matam at the exact same time. A second answer that he said that the existence of Klal Yisrael has no rhyme and there was once a poem written by a Goy who talked about the Babylonians and the Egyptians and how they prospered and then they sunk into the ground. Then he moved on to the Romans and the Greeks and what they had their glorious time and they ended up disappearing from the face of the earth. Who hears today about Rome? or Greece, they're of the weakest and powerless countries in the world. And he went through a whole litany of, of different examples of power and strength and how it disappeared from the face of the earth. And then he concluded his poem or whatever he wrote, um, he said, but the Jew, after he cited all these countries and all of were always here, always survived, always has had continuity, and that is the most puzzling thing, how a co community and a nation 
that was so kicked around and so abused and so persecuted flourished in every generation. And the writer of this composition was Lahavdal Mark Twain. A goy who recognized so Reb Moshe Lahavdal ben Lahavdal Elf Abdullah says in his Sefer that the second terrace of why the Medish would compare Klal Yisrael to the Paraduma because their existence and their survival is without rhyme and reason. That according to nature, we should have been gone 3,000 years ago. They were after us, they wanted to destroy us, they wanted us buried and forgotten. And we are still the cementing factor of events in the world to this very day. The whole UN is existing to be able to put down Eretz Yisrael and Yidden and UNESCO always against Eretz Yisrael and consulate, but we are always thriving because our power was never the might of an air force. It was the power of a Gemara and a Mishnayis and a Chumash and the tzedakah and chesed of what Klal Yisrael has done, that we are here ready for the Gula Shalema because of what we stand for. And that's what the Rosh Yeshiva said, that we are without rhyme and reason because it's not an existence of nature, but it's a supernatural existence of survival. Now, The Urachayim HaKadosh, who I said his yard said is coming up, and uh, he asks a question, why at the beginning of our parsha, parsha Chukas, does it call the Paraduma Zos Chukas HaTorah? It should say, this is Chukas HaTuma or Tahara, something pertaining specifically only to Paraduma. But it's as Zos Chukas HaTorah, as if it's compared to the entire Torah. So there are Mephorshim who say that the Chet of Adam Marisha with Chava, we know they were told not to eat from the Eitz Hadas, and they were also told because they were created in the ninth hour, like three o'clock in the afternoon, that the Eitz which most hold, certainly the Mekubon, that it was grapes, that you can, after three hours, take the grapes and make Kiddush, Shabbos is going to come in. And they didn't wait because the Nachash talked them in that God doesn't want you to eat from it. Because the day you eat from it, you're going to become like him. You're going to understand everything. Now, the truth is that they did understand everything except for 0.001%. But 99% plus, they understood. But it wasn't enough that the Nachash came and was convincing them and they went along with it. Had they just waited the three hours till six o'clock in the afternoon, says the Arizal, they would have been able to make Kiddush and enjoy the grapes and everything. For those three hours of impatience, we, Klal Yisrael, are suffering now, 5,783 years later, with death, with sickness, with persecute, with everything we've lived through, because they ate from the Eitz Hadas. And the Taina of the Nachosh was, that if we eat from the eight Hadas, we send Kelo Kim, that you'll be just like our Kodesh Baruch, you'll understand not 99.9, but 100% of what's out there. And they ate, and we are paying the price. But it was, we send Kelo Kim Yodea to know everything completely. 
So since that was the original sin of wanting to know every last thing, therefore the Torah compares Hora Duma Zos Chukas HaTorah, the entire embodiment of the Torah. Because when you come to any mitzvah or anything that you don't fully understand, like Basar Bacholov and all the list of the things that are under that category and umbrella of Chukim, that it's not meant for you to understand every single thing, and that's what got us into trouble to begin with, with Adam and Chava. Wanting to, when it said, you'll be like God, it meant, Yodea Tov you're going to know everything then. So because of that, therefore, it's not only the mitzvah of Paraduma, but there's so many aspects of life that we come to, we don't know the crossroad. We want to do our best to understand it and proceed with accurate precision in our decision making. But most of the time it's way off base. It doesn't even come near to what we have to do. And that v'yisem kelokim yodea tov, yodea tov v'ra, that it brings us closer to accepting that which we do not understand. And that's why I want to say to you that at the end of the sedra, fukas, there is a very interesting, we don't find it anywhere in the Chamisha from Shaitoro, there was a city called Cheshven, and strategically it was an excellent city to be in control of. And Klal Yisrael wanted to wage war with Cheshven and take it over. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu told them that the ones whose control now, who has the city of Cheshven, is Moab, and Moab is your cousin, and therefore I forbid you to wage war against your relative. Now let's not forget that Moab and Ammon didn't want Klai to step near their city. They were willing to pay as they were going through the Midbar. They were willing to pay for everything, to have some water, or just to pass through as a shortcut. And they said, you walk near our city, we're going to come out full battle and kill every one of you. So they didn't, they didn't go through there. And with this back, and therefore we are forbidden to marry into. After three generations, we can marry a Mitzri who beat us and killed us and threw the babies into the water, but not Moab and Amma. So here, that's how they treated us, yet I could have said, they still are your cousins. And therefore, I don't want you to wage war. What happened? Sichon waged war with Moab and captured Cheshbon. And then I could have said, oh, now, Sichon is not under Moab anymore. You can wage war. And they waged war and they took control of Cheshbon. And at the end of our Sedra, you will find a poetic expression of what was said that that Al Ken Yomru HaMoishlim, those who display and express tremendous parables that very unusual this whole poem that's there if you take a look look at Tarashi you'll see like what is said about it but the Mephorshim say that this whole Parsha of this story of Moab and Cheshven was to teach Ayid 
that when you look at a situation, you may want to attack Cheshbon, because it's a very good city to have in it. But Akrabish Baruch Hu arranges the chessboard differently than you think. And many times we think we have the answers, and we have the approach, and we know, we think we know what we want to do, and it's completely turned on its head, it's turned over, and it doesn't happen. And we're disappointed, but we don't realize that Akadosh Baruch Hu knows exactly what's happening, and he can come in and two hours later from left field with a different pathway to achieve what you really need or wanted that you never dreamt of. Because Klai Yisrael never thought that Sichon would attack Moab and get Cheshven into their control. And then it became Mutter for the Yid, and then they did it, and they got control of Cheshven. Now, we, we find in the Sedra the story, and by the way, in Chukas, Miriam is Nifter, and Aaron is Nifter, and we have the story that Klai Yisrael ganged up on Moshe and Aaron that they didn't have water. So, and Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu to speak to the rock, and he hit the rock, and he paid a price for that because he wasn't allowed to go into Eretz Yisrael because of this story. Now, Rav Moshe Feinstein asks a very good question. It doesn't need my ask. I'm just saying it's a very thought-provoking question, if there's a group of people standing there and somebody walks over to a rock that's not connected to any pod planet, just a big rock on the ground, and he speaks to the rock and water comes out, it's a big miracle. But if he didn't speak, but he went over and he just hit the rock, that's also a tremendous miracle. I mean, who would think that you can walk over to a rock and hit it with your stick and then a gushing water comes out? So ask the Rosh Hashiva, why was that so bad that he hit the miracle? Because the Pusik says right after, Yan, that Yan ki. Yakti Sheni, Le'ini B'nai Yisrael, you didn't make a public Kiddush Hashem. As if speaking to the rock, there's a big Kiddush Hashem. But hitting the rock, there was no Kiddush Hashem. Why, says Reb Moshe? So he answers and says a very basic thing, which is good for all of us to remember. When a person is told by a Kurdish Baruch Hu to do something. Maisa ovo simen levana. It wasn't just the actual thing that minute. It had a ripple effect and it drenched the Metzias of Klal Yisrael to be able to effectively do what was happening then, Ladoros. Yidn, in difficult situations, would have the power of tefillah to correct the, that which is happening. A person needs children, a person needs parnas, a person needs a shidduch, a person needs a refuah. That the key to it is davening. And The fact that Moshe Rabbeinu, if he would have spoken to the rock, it would have make it, made even more powerful the Koya Hadiba of every Yid Ladoros in every situation that they found themselves. But the fact that he hit the rock, still Tvila is the greatest and highest, and the, 
but not at the level that it could have been had he just spoken. So of course, hitting the rock was also a tremendous miracle, but it did not send off the ripple effect Lodoros the way it could have happened. And the, you know, somebody once said that when you go to the ocean, don't go with a teaspoon. I mean, if you're going to take water out of the ocean, come with buckets, with, with bushel, with something gigantic. Don't come with a little teaspoon to take out. And that they compare, that Chazal says, that muscle, when it comes to davening, davening can accomplish so much and effectively remedy so many problems in one's life. Don't come with a little tefillah with a teaspoon and a, come with the full koyach believing that this davening could heal and remedy and sell, bring the salvation that the person needs and do it with the fervor, zest, and zeal in such a way that it should bring a reaction commensurate with what the bakasha is. And don't go with just a teaspoon and through the motion of what tefillah is. So had he spoken only, it would have widened the dimension of the vista of Maisa of Osimila Bonham in the Debor. That Debor would have helped that enhance and uplifted and upgraded the power of speaking. Now, I want to tell you, and I said it many months, maybe last year to you, that there's a difference of opinion. That means when we look at the story of the rock and the water, all of that, and Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't go into Israel because of it. Now we know Al Pi Kabbalah that Moshe Rabbeinu anyway had to remain in the Midbar. Because when it comes to Trias HaMesim, there are many people who are not Zoichet to it, says the Ariza. But if there's a Tzaddik in the cemetery where you're buried and the, the person's not really worthy of getting up and going to Israel. If there's a big tzaddik in that cemetery, they have the right to latch on to the tzaddik and go with him. And that's the reason that many tzaddikim did not want to be buried in Eretz Yisrael. They bedavka wanted to stay in Chutzla Oretz so that they would be able to be uplifted at time of Chiyas HaMesim and all 20,000 in that cemetery could go with the tzaddik to Eretz Yisrael and be part of the Trias HaMesim. And there were in the Midbar 600,000 who had died and Shevet Ephraim who went out early, the 36,000 that died early because they left Mitzrayim too early. So they are able to hold on to Moshe Rabbeinu and he's going to take them. So he had to remain Aver Layarding for these people of the Kabbalah. And the simple reason was he didn't so because he didn't speak, he only hit the rock. And then he asked that at least he should go in after he's nifter and they should bring his body in. And that he was denied because when the daughters of, of Yisrael saw him and came home and told their father the report of what happened, they called him an Ish Mitzri. 
an Egyptian man. And it was a criticism to Moshe Rabbeinu because he should have conveyed by his appearance and his speech that he was a Yid. And that was the reason that he couldn't go in even after he was Nifter. But the reason I just told you about Picabol that he had to remain together in the Midbor, Aver Layardin, to be able to be of help to that Chalik of Kal Yisrael. Now, the Rambam says that the reason that Moshe Rabbeinu could not go into Israel has nothing to do with hitting the rock or speaking to the rock. But it's because he called Klal Yisrael, Shimu no Hamoyrim. You rebellious people, listen and see what's going to happen now. And he brought out the water. But since as a leader he referred to his flock, to Klal Yisrael, as Moirim, those who are rebellious, like in a very downgrading, condescending way, the way he spoke to them, that's why he couldn't go in. <laughs> so the Rambam says, because he said Shimon Nohamoyer, that was the Avera, and that's why he did not go in. Now, if you um, look at what his Talmidim wrote, they brought a, they marshaled a support to the Rambam's point of view, which is a tremendous. booster uh, to the excellence of his opinion because they said that it couldn't have been because he hit the rock or spoke to the rock, any of that but we on Shemini Atzeris ask for Geshem and when we come to the stanza we have the stanza for Avram Avinu then for Yitzchok, then for Yaakov then Moshe and in the stanza of Moshe, it talks about that on the rock he hit it and water came out. Now we are asking Hashem to give us Geshem for the entire year. So if it was something that he did wrong, why would we even mention it? We're talking about in the schools of Moshe, or first they schools of Avram, and they bring reasons, and then Yitzchak, then Yaakov, then Moshe Rabbeinu. And as part of the stanza of what it says is Al Hasela Hach Vayetsu Maya, as a praise. So as Talmud said, that if it was because he hit the rock, why would we put that stanza into the Bakosha for Geshem on Shmini Atzeris if it was something wrong that he did. And that's the proof that they want to bring to substantiate the opinion of the Rambam that it had nothing to do with the rock. It had to do with how he spoke. And we learned from that that our patience cannot wane when we're teaching a class and we can't suddenly say, oh, you troublemakers. Uh, or with our children. Or with our kahila, if we're rabbonim, or we're mashpian in any way. That patience is a very vital, important aspect of our hanhoga in wanting to effectively be mashpia to other people. Now, The, I want to mention something about Parsha's Bullock before we conclude. You know that in the beginning, when Bullock sent to Bilam emissaries to come, commission him to come back and curse the Jews, so when they first got there, he said, you know, let's wait overnight and I'll answer you in the morning. And he said, no, I can't go with you. 
Then they went home and told Bullock, and Bullock came, sent back a group, and he wanted to upgrade with promising him COVID when he comes, and money, and honor, and all of that. So what, and then I could have spoken, told them, okay, you want to go, you can go. What happened the first day when he was told, don't go with them? And the next day, or a few days later, he was told, no problem, go ahead with them. So the Meforshim explained that originally when Bullock sent to Bilaam, Bilaam hated the Jews, and he was thrilled to go to do whatever he could to harm them, hurt them, and help destroy them. But the first day there was no promise of money or COVID. So he was altruistic in just his hate for the Jews. That I could his birth who didn't want him to go because of someone even for something bad has pure intention, he can sometimes succeed. So he was told not to. But the next trip of the group who came to fetch Bilam to come curse, then they started promising him money and profit. So once he had all of these side benefits, which would enhance his status as a person, a human being, so then it says, oh, once you have already diverted from the purity of purpose, now you can go because it'll never work anyway. And it was that that the Kotzka Rebbe said when somebody asked him that why is it by the Catholics that they're so successful? They have big churches, they have all the money in the world. And look at the Jews, they, they're struggling and they have little shtiblach and they don't have the grandeur of what the Catholics have. So he answered and said, because the Catholics serve the Sheker. That means the religion is totally false and nonsense. They serve the Sheker with Emmas. They are sincere in their devotion to their religion, even though it's Sheker. And the Jews, unfortunately, serve the Emmas with Shekhar, that we are not pure enough in how we have our avoidness of Shem. So that's the reason that the second day or the second visit that it said, now it's no problem for you to go. It can, anything that's not with pure good intention cannot succeed. Then Now, in Chukas, coming back, I just wanted to say to you that when they left Mitzrayim, Moshe Rabbeinu said to Shira Aliyah, Hosea Shir Moshe, and his name is mentioned. Now, there's another Shira said in our Sedra, 40 years later, when they were finally ready to go into Israel, and it doesn't mention Moshe Rabbeinu. So the Meforshim say, that the reason for that is because in the, when they left Mitzrayim, they didn't know how to say and what to say and how to live. But Moshe Rabbeinu served as a role model for all 40 years. And once they were taught how to live like a child, they grow up in the house. After 20 years, they, 25 years, they get married. And they're able, if the parents were effective, to instill and inject into the atmosphere of a new Jewish home, 
the values to put up the mezuzahs, not to have a day of, in that household without tzedakah, a quarter, a nickel, but something every single day. Where do they take that from? Where do they learn that from? It comes from the parents. And how the parents, of the children never saw the father open up a safer or say a Dvar Torah. So at their homes, they'll sit down at the Shabbos table and talk about Trump and talk about the stock market and they'll talk about this and that because that's what they saw. Over here, Moshe Rabbeinu did not have to be mentioned because he was their teacher and he was their backbone and he was their guide for life. But after 40 years of seeing how he did Avoida, we didn't, in saying Shira Klal Yisrael, have to even mention Moshe Rabbeinu because he seeped into every aspect of the mahus of their nishamas and what they were. Now, coming back to Bullock, if you were driving your car and the car suddenly stopped and started talking to you, you'd be in shock, not the radio, not some voicemail on your phone, but the car is talking to you. Here, the chamor, and this was a chamor from way, way back that had tremendous power to it, and Hashem showed him the malach who was standing there swinging the swirling sword, and he wanted to protect Bilam because if he walked straight ahead, he would have gone straight into the sword. So why did he continue on his trip when finally Hashem opened his eyes and he saw the reason that the Chamor, and the Chamor even it says that what did you hit me these three times? And it doesn't say Shalosh Pa'omim, it says Shalosh Regolim. And the Chazal say that since he said the word Regolim, that he imbued and uplifted the quality of every regal that every yid would go to Eretz Yisrael to Yerushalayim on the Shalosh Regolim. And that's what he was referring to. So this wasn't just a stama conversation. But why did he continue after he got the whole story that the, the, the Hamor was not crazy and just veering off the road, uh, causing trouble over here. But there was a good reason. Hashem showed him there was a malach there swirling. But the answer is that we can have, even right in front of our eyes, a swirling sword. And we can hear the voice of our Kodesh Baruch, that the malach is right there, and still go on on the path, as Bilam did. And the lesson to us in life is we are constantly showing or hear in different ways the voice of our British Burgle. We have a sign, we have a feeling, don't do this, don't do that, but we go ahead and do it. And an entire life of encountering Simonin of what to do, and that's why a person should always have a, a mashpia or a rebbe or a rosh yeshiva, someone that they don't gear their life according to their own seichel. They turn for guidance, for leadership, for, for knowledge in how to live their lives. And when we're told it, if we ignore it, that's the voice of the Malach coming out and saying, don't go, don't do it. But we live through life ignoring the voices and the lessons that are put before us in the framework of being able to succeed properly in our daily lives. And we go through life ignoring the advice 
the leadership and the guidance. And I want to say to you that the Ar HaShulchan says that if a person says before Chatzos one word, Baruch of Shemona Esrei, that means 30 seconds later is Chatzos. He can't say the whole Shemona Esrei, but says the Ar HaShulchan, if he says one word, of Baruch just, he's got his foot in the door. And I've mentioned this to you. Now the Baal Shem Tev says, there's a Gemara in Baruchas that asks, what was the intention of Bilam? And the Gemara and Toysus there in the Zion of it, Aleph at the top, that first Toysus, talks about the fact that Bilam wanted to capture the 16th of a second that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is angry with Kal Yisrael every day. And while he's angry, he wanted to say the curse. So Toysus asked, what could he have said in a 16th of a second? So Toysus answers that he could have said Kale, destroy them. Because once he would say Kalim, he could finish the Klala because he has his foot in the door in that 16th of a second. And from that, the Baal Shem Tev said what the Orach HaShulchan says, that if a person davened Shemona Esrei and says just Baruch, the word Baruch, and begin Shemona Esrei, even if the 99% of Shemona Esrei is already on the other side of the fence after Chatzos, he got it in with the one word Baruch, because if by cursing you can get your foot in the door, certainly for a good thing like Shemona Esrei, we can get our foot into the door. The point being that we are able to avail ourselves to the richness of tefillah. And that fort that I told you before is from the Saporna, who says the idea of not going to the ocean with a little teaspoon. That's not his mushal. But on that Saporna, that's what they say. Because he elaborates on how powerful the power of speech is and what it can accomplish for the person. And I always say to you that even though that learning and other things are tremendous, but like Rabbi Moshe Feinstein always used to say that the power of Tefillah in many situations takes precedence to even learning Torah when it comes to saving a neshama, someone besakana, all of these things, because the power of our, excuse me, of our speech is so overwhelming and so effective that we would really concentrate and delve into what we are saying much more if we fully appreciated the power of tefillah. Have a good week, a good Shabbos, bracha v'hatzlocha.